What if I told you that all of those great classic novels that you were forced to read in school, you know, all those books that we fell asleep reading and that we got no pleasure out of, what if I told you that they were not only incredibly important to your mental health, but to your actual ability to just get through life? You wouldn't believe me? Well, I wouldn't blame you. The way all these books are taught to us in school is in such a boring, academic way that it's virtually impossible for us to get into the story. We're just unable to understand how or why it's relevant to us and to our lives. And yet still, these books could save your life. My goal in this video is to show you how. So stick around, you don't want to miss it. But first, be sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel if you're new, and sign up to our email list. We've got a lot of great content coming out that you don't want to miss right now. How can these books save your life? Well, great literature has survival value. And what I mean by that is that these novels give us larger than life heroes and villains that can act as examples for us to either emulate or avoid in our own lives. And, you know, movies can give us a taste of this value, so there's a reason why movies like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, people just flock to them over and over again because they give us incredibly inspiring heroes that we can look up to and try and emulate in our own lives. Well, great novels have this same power, but at a deeper level. They give us more insight into the characters. They give us a more comprehensive view of what's going on in inside those people. And because of that, they have the power to teach us about our own lives and about how we should act in the world. So if this is the case, then why don't people read anymore? Well, our culture has betrayed us in regard to great literature. In school, we weren't reading these novels for the story. We were reading it to understand the cultural context or whatever that the, the novel was written in. We're reading for some higher literary purpose that doesn't really have anything to do with ourselves or with our own life. It's just to, to study the material, to study the themes and the context and the, the cultural relevance, but not to understand what's the story and what's inspiring these characters, what's driving them, what's moving them. We don't get any of that in school. We just sat around and made up fake interpretations about what the theme is and, you know, the teachers are telling us that this is what we have to do, you have to write this essay, and it wasn't for any purpose or anything. There wasn't any, there was, it wasn't fun is the thing. And the sad end result is that it makes us dread wanting to read great classic literature. We get this bad taste in our mouths about it, that it's boring and not for us. So what does it actually mean to read a novel for the story? Well, a novel is just a story of characters in action. It shows those characters doing things, but doing those things for a certain reason. And the primary purpose of reading the story, and, and this is the story, is understanding what's driving those people. What makes them tick? Why are they doing what they're doing? And that's not just the primary purpose of reading the story, it's also the primary pleasure. Understanding these characters and what they're all about. But why? What is it about their motivations that's so important or so interesting? Well, it's because what's happening is we're getting a glimpse into that character's psychology into that character's mind, into the way they're functioning, into the way they're thinking, into the way they're handling things. The more books you read, the more you'll find that these kinds of motivations, the assortment of motivations that are driving these kinds of characters, they're timeless issues of how we all function, of human nature as such. And because of that, it can apply to your own life. So I want to give a few examples of just exactly what I'm talking about from the movies I mentioned. In The Lord of the Rings, towards the end of The Fellowship of the Ring, the first movie, Frodo is in a place where he has to make a choice. He started to see that the evil of the ring has started to corrupt the Fellowship, and he understands that he's not going to be able to continue his journey with them, and that he's going to have to go off on his own and finish the journey by himself. He's given a moment where we can see on the screen, you know, he's in tears and he's holding the ring, and he has to make a decision to go on alone, and we know that he's scared, that he, he doesn't really want to, that this isn't the life he wanted, that he's going to miss his friends. All you have to decide what to do with 
the time that is given to him. And he knows there's no one going with him, there's no one who's gonna help him. Sam eventually comes to help him, but in this moment, he knows that it's just gonna be him. And in the face of all of that, he chooses to do it anyway. He puts the ring in his pocket, he gets in the boat, and he goes off. In a moment where it wasn't even, you know, necessarily his responsibility to destroy this ring, it just happened to be him. Even in the face of that flick of chance, he chooses to go and do it anyway. What we're given is a brief glimpse into what's going on inside his soul, the kinds of things that are bothering him and consuming him, what he's struggling with, and then we see him choose. Or in Star Wars, in Return of the Jedi, towards the end of that movie, Luke sort of goes and turns himself in to the Emperor, knowing that he's risking his life. But we get something else from him. There's a sort of heavy confidence he has in his father, Darth Vader, whom he's counting on to save him when the time comes. Well, why is he counting on his father? Because what we're given to understand is that Luke believes and has incredible faith and confidence in the power of good over evil. And he knows that given the right opportunity, that his father has it within himself to overcome the evil in his soul and turn back to the light, turn away from the dark side. And again, that eventually happens. I've accepted the truth that you were once Anakin Skywalker, my father. That name no longer has any meaning for me. It is the name of your true self you've only forgotten. I know there is good in you. The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. But in that moment, we're given just a glimpse into what's driving him. His confidence in himself and his own belief in good over evil. And thus that same belief in the good in the soul of his father. And that it's in his father to turn against the dark side and come back to the light. And there's just an incredible benevolence and forgiveness towards his father's soul in that moment. And again, we're just given a brief insight into what's driving this character, what's motivating and making him tick. And so what's happening in both of these examples is that in these moments we're given a glimpse to look inside these characters' souls, to understand what's driving them, to see their motivations at work. And what's incredible is that this is actually something you literally never see in real life. I mean, when's the last time you saw, you know, inside someone's soul? They might explain their motivations to you or something, but you don't actually get that moment where you get to understand what's going on inside them in the way in which it's presented to you in art, in these movies, and in literature. In the story, you're actually seeing the mechanics of that motivation at work. It's like it's laser-focused, like a, like a magnifying glass, like concentrating sunlight, and it's just shining into that character's soul. And the power of such insights is that the next time there's something that you're afraid of, something that you're afraid of facing, you can think of Frodo, and you can remember his profound courage in the face of all of the troubles that he was facing. Or, let's say, the next time you're doubting yourself, you can think of Luke, and you can remember the confidence he had in the power of good over evil. The confidence he had in, in his own belief in that, in the belief in his father, and ultimately the good does triumph. And you can remember that. You can take that with you into your own life and be inspired by it every day. You can remember how those characters thought and what they felt. You can learn so much about humans, about human nature, about emotions, about ethics, just from getting into and understanding the motivations that are driving the characters and the stories that you read, just by witnessing their conflicts and struggles. Now, these examples are just movies, but the experience is even more profound when you're reading literature, because on the page, you're actually given insight on a deeper level than you can get in a movie about what's going on inside that character, what's driving them. Their interior dialogue is more more sharply lit up. So now I want to turn to a book that a lot of us read in school. It was certainly one I read in school and kind of talk about the value of it from <laughs> coming at it from this perspective rather than the perspective of, oh, this is just academic literature. And that book is The Scarlet Letter. I found this book boring as f 
I couldn't stand it. For those of you who don't know, it's about Puritan society, and in this society a woman commits adultery and, and gets ostracized, and our teacher had us studying, you know, the, the nature of a Puritan society, uh, like the symbolism of the random stuff in the story, any kind of random parallels that there were between you know, Puritan society and maybe like our world today. It was just a bunch of nonsense. What we weren't studying was what's going on inside these characters and why. And so essentially it just wasn't useful. I, d I didn't see any use in reading the book for my own life. There was no pleasure in it. I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense to me. And that was my experience with that book. We basically looked at everything except what was going on inside those characters, how they felt, what their experience was. And it wasn't until I was older that I reread the book and actually realized that it's like a tour de force of <laughs> just incredible drama. So I, I just want to go over it really quick and, and break it down just in essentials so that you understand what I'm talking about. So again, like I said, it's, it's set in this Puritan society. A woman commits adultery and ends up bearing the child of that act. And it's that one act that shapes the rest of the novel. That's how the novel starts. And the rest of the novel tracks the consequences of that one action in the three principal characters, who's the woman, her husband, and her lover. So what happens with these three characters? Well, the woman, she's ostracized from the society. Everybody knows that she committed adultery. She has to go live by herself, like across the woods. And basically she's, she's sort of forced to bear her guilt in an open way. Everybody knows, she knows, like it's just, it's out in the open and she bears it and she spends years living that way. Now, meanwhile, her lover, no one knows that he was the man that she was with. And so he continues on in the society, sort of bearing his guilt, but in a concealed way. He's, he's hiding it within himself, he's repressing it. And what we see is that the woman, her name's Hester, because Hester is able to to bear her guilt openly, she's actually able to bear it, and she's sort of normal, you know, she, she goes through her life in a normal kind of way, whereas her lover, because he's bearing his guilt inside, is just constantly tormented. Uh, he, he can't ever express himself, he can't ever get it out, and so there's these violent outbursts of just passionate emotion that he goes through and sort of randomly throughout the book, because he's, he's unable to actually deal with his guilt, he's repressing it. And what we get is this is j just that alone is sort of an excellent study in the psychology of the repression of guilt in someone and like what it does to you. What happens when you're hiding from your emotions? What happens when you're hiding from your guilt and you, you can't deal with it? Whereas Hester is able to deal with her guilt over time because she's bearing it openly. Now, meanwhile, the husband is incredibly jealous and consumed with this desire for revenge against the man his wife was with. And we're sort of shown what happens to a man when his emotions are left unchecked and just given full reign and it just consumes this man's life and ultimately ends up destroying him. And so through him we're given this excellent glimpse into the psychology of emotionalism and like what's going on there. And so we, we have the whole spectrum of, of what's going on when you're not handling your emotions correctly. So we get Hester who sort of is handling her emotions correctly. We get her lover who, you know, is tormented by repression. And then we get her husband who is just full throttle emotional emotionalist and just consumed by revenge. And that's just in those three characters alone. Now, this isn't necessarily like the theme of the book. The theme is is something about, you know, natural law is better than human law or something like that. But the theme here isn't important. What I'm trying to get at is what you're learning, the inspiration is in studying these characters and seeing how they're functioning psychologically, how they're operating, because that's something that you can take away with you into your own life. You know, like, oh, I don't, I, I shouldn't repress my emotions. I don't want to be like the woman's lover, or I, I shouldn't let myself be con consumed by my emotions either and, and end up like the husband. I need to face my emotions. I need to deal with them openly. And you can just take that away from reading The Scarlet Letter. There's a whole lot more you can get out of the book, but I just want to give this one example as just that alone has value to your life. And it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to, to read 
read and study these characters and understand that and get into it and, and think about how that can apply to you and your own life. But again, in school, we're not taught to look at the novel from like this angle, what like the story and the motivations of the characters. We're just taught about the Puritan society and the theme and all that stuff. And we're, we're never really given a moment to enjoy the story and get into it. And, but, I mean, properly taught, all those other aspects can be relevant, you know, studying the Puritan society and, and understanding how the theme fits into all of this. I, I can imagine a teacher properly teaching the book would integrate the story with all of that, and it would make more sense and be more enjoyable. But, you know, as taught, we're just looking at minutia that doesn't matter. We're not allowed to enjoy or experience the enjoyment of reading the story and the motivations of those characters. But the whole point of what makes reading a story enjoyable in the first place is that we get to witness these characters' motivations and their struggles and their conflicts, to see what they're going through and how they're dealing with those problems. And that's something that we can take away in an abstract form into our own lives. When we encounter struggles and conflicts in our own lives, we can remember how those characters dealt with things. It doesn't have to be particular, but it's just that it's it's like a, a spirit fuel that's sitting inside you that you took away from reading these books, and you can use that fuel to get through the day. I mean, if the book is good, the author has observed something about human nature, about the way we function, that he thinks is important and worth sharing, and he's giving it to us in the form of a dramatic story. And if we're not looking at the dramatic story, if we're not understanding that element of it, then we're really not understanding what that author has to say at all. And and we're missing the value of reading the book in the first place. I mean, the reason Lord of the Rings is so popular in the first place is because it offers us a world of heroes. They're courageous. They're fighting for good. We see a world where heroism and achievement and success is possible in the face of incredible incredible odds. And that's inspiring. That's survival value. It can keep you motivated, keep you moving, keep you alive. And so my my goal in this video is to, to open you up to this world, or at least to try, to try to open you up to the world of getting into great classic literature. It's not boring if you come at it from this perspective, from this angle. Some of the most important truths that I've learned about human nature have come from the novels I've read. And I mean, obviously there's more to talk about here, there's more complexity, but I mean, I think this is a great place to start. This is the reason why you should try to start adding great literature to your life. And I mean, if, if you've got any questions about this, please leave me a comment below. Like I said, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. There's all kinds of things we can discuss, so, so let me know in the comments. And finally, I've put together a list of books that I think are a great place to start, so if you agree with this approach and you want to try and get started, I've got some recommendations. There's a link in the description below. Click the link and you'll get access to, you know, a list of great novels. I've picked all of these books based on emotional insight, emotional depth, and just dramatic fun, so all of them are a sure bet. Pick the one that you think would be the most interesting for you. And again, that link is in the description below. Click it and get your copy today. And as always, again, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and thank you so much for watching this video.